So we're reading from Joshua chapter 10. We're actually looking at Joshua 10, 11 and 12 this morning, but we're just going to read one section from chapter 10, beginning at verse 1. Now Adonai Zedek, king of Jerusalem, heard that Joshua had taken Ai and totally destroyed it, doing to Ai and its king as he had done to Jericho and its king, and that the people of Gibeon had made a treaty of peace with Israel and had become their allies. He and his people were very much alarmed at this because Gibeon was an important city, like one of the royal cities. It was larger than Ai and all its men were good fighters. So Adonai Zedek, king of Jerusalem, appealed to Hotham, to Hoham, king of Hebron, Piram, king of Jamuth, Japhia, king of Lachish, and Debir, king of Eglon. Come up and help me attack Gibeon, he said, because it has made peace with Joshua and the Israelites. <clears throat> then the five kings of the Amorites, the kings of Jerusalem, Hebron, Jarmuth, Lachish, and Eglon, joined forces. They moved up with all their troops and took up positions against Gibeon and attacked it. The Gibeonites then sent word to Joshua in the camp at Gilgal, Don't abandon your servants. Come up to us quickly and save us. Help us because all the Amorite kings from the hill country have joined forces against us. So Joshua marched up from Gilgal with his entire army, including all the best fighting men. The Lord said to Joshua, do not be afraid of them. I have given them into your hand. Not one of them will be able to withstand you. After an all-night march from Gilgal, Joshua took them by surprise. The Lord threw them into confusion before Israel, so Joshua and the Israelites defeated them completely at Gibeon. Israel pursued them along the road going up to Beth Horon and cut them down all the way to Azekar and Makedar. As they fled before Israel on the road down from Beth Horon to Azekar, the Lord hurled large hailstones down on them, and more of them died from the hail than were killed by the swords of the Israelites. On the day the Lord gave the Amorites over to Israel, Joshua said to the Lord in the presence of Israel, Son, stand still over Gibeon, and you, moon, over the valley of Ajalon. So the sun stood still and the moon stopped till the nation avenged itself on its enemies, as it is written in the book of Jashar. The sun stopped in the middle of the sky and delayed going down about a full day. There has never been a day like it before or since, a day when the Lord listened to a human being. Surely the Lord was fighting for Israel. Then Joshua returned with all Israel to the camp at Gilgal. Now the five kings had fled and hidden in the cave at Makedar. When Joshua was told that the five kings had been found hiding in the cave at Makedar, he said, Roll large rocks up to the mouth of the cave and post some men there to guard it. But don't stop. Pursue your enemies. Attack them from the rear and don't let them reach their cities. For the Lord your God has given them into your hand. So Joshua and the Israelites defeated them completely, but a few survivors managed to reach their fortified cities. The whole army then returned safely to Joshua in the camp at Makedar, and no one uttered a word against the Israelites. Joshua said, Open the mouth of the cave and bring those five kings out to me. So they brought the five kings out of the cave, the kings of Jerusalem, Hebron, Jarmuth, Lachish and Eglon. When they had brought these kings to Joshua, he summoned all the men of Israel and said to the army commanders who had come with him, Come here and put your feet on the necks of these kings. So they came forward and placed their feet on their necks. Joshua said to them, Don't be afraid. Don't be discouraged. Be strong and courageous. This is what the Lord will do to all the enemies you are going to fight. Then Joshua put the kings to death and exposed their bodies on five poles and they were left hanging on the poles until evening. At sunset Joshua gave the order and they took them down from the poles and threw them into the cave where they had been hiding. At the mouth of the cave they placed large rocks 
which are there to this day. We're going to leave it there, but keep that in your hand because we're going to be looking at that as we, as we go through this chapter. Let me, let me pray as we uh, look at this, these verses. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you that we have a record of what you have done over the centuries. We thank you that we can um, be learning from you today as we read your word. We pray you'd give us understanding and also hearts that are wanting to respond to you and to obey you. Help us to listen well to you now, in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, we've actually come to the halfway point in Joshua. This uh, chapter 12 <clears throat> marks the, the point in which they've basically um, conquered all of Canaan. And um, the Israelites have entered the land. And now in chapters 10 to 12, it's the completion of the fighting. This is God's people taking the land. And what God wants to impress upon them is the same as what he wants to impress upon us. It's God's battle. It's his battle. And he wins. And to be on his side is to be on the winning side. Now last week as we were, as we were sitting here at this time, we mentioned a little game that was coming on in the evening. And um, we weren't sure who would win the Rugby League Grand Final. But now we know who has won. Sorry, Jenny and Beryl. I know you don't like the Panthers, but they did win. We know who's the winning side. Maybe next year, Parramatta might get up there. Beryl, that's right. Beryl was just telling me how Parramatta is going to be in the Grand Final. So we'll see. I'm not sure if she's on the winning side or not, but we'll see. The thing today is that if you know who wins, you know who to pledge your allegiance to. If you know who wins, you know who to pledge your allegiance to. Whether it's Trump or Harris, whether it's the Panthers or the Storm, if you know who wins, you know who to pledge your allegiance to. If you know who wins, you know where to invest your resources, your time, your hope. And you're willing to put your all into it even when the going gets tough because you know who's going to win. In Joshua, we see that it's God who wins. And today we hear about the opposition that seeks to defeat him. And in these three chapters today, we see two great alliances formed to fight against the Israelites. But the message for us this morning is that God is going to win. He keeps on telling Joshua, you're going to win. <laughs> it's already, it's a done deal. So how does this affect the way we think about God, the choices we make? One of the things about the book of Joshua is, as we've been seeing all the way through, is that God is at the centre of all that's happening there, isn't he? He's the one who's controlling events. He's the one who's winning the battles. He's chosen this people, these Israelites, not because they're worthy uh, or special, but just that he is gracious. He's going to display himself to all nations through the Israelites. God has chosen this land for this people as well. And this is God's battle as he wins the land. The Israelites just have to be obedient in carrying out God's commands. They're given the task of carrying out God's judgment on the Canaanites. The Canaanites, even while seeing how powerful God, the one true God, Yahweh, is, they refuse to acknowledge him as the one true God. And this is shown in their opposition to God in, this, in these alliances. So as we're reading through, just as we've said, I think I've said a number of times, the writer has included certain things here. And he's left a lot of stuff out as well. So we want to think, why has he included certain things? What, what is he wanting us to learn from this? Okay, let's have a look at the passage then. So have this in front of you. The first five verses, again, it's a bit like chapter 9 where th this same alliance is mentioned, the, uh, the, this uh, southern alliance of five kings who uh, band together. And they've, they've uh, heard about Gibeon, who's, in their, in their way of thinking, has turned traitor and has allied themselves with um, the Israelites. And we heard about them last week, tricking the Israelites into making a, an alliance. 
So we see these two groups. There's, the, there's that alliance of, of kings who are opposing God, but there's also Gibeon who has responded to, uh, to trust God and to ask for um, to be allied to the Israelites. So here are the nations gathering to fight against God and his people. And this is a theme we find right throughout the Bible. Um, God's enemies gathering to fight against them. And we see that we see that in Jesus' life. We see the opposition to Jesus. And um, right, right through to the last book of the Bible, Revelation, where the, the, the forces against God are massed and there's a final big uh, battle that God wins. So back to the story. The Israelites come to help the Gibeonites and there is this continual reminder this is the Lord's battle. Did you notice as we read through verse 8, the Lord speaks to Joshua. God speaks to him and tells him, hey, it's okay, Josh, I've given them into your hands. The battle hasn't been fought yet, but I've given them into your hands. Verse 10, the Lord, the Lord throws the opposing forces into confusion. Verse 11, the Lord sends large hailstones. More die from the hailstones than from the Israelites killing them. Verse 12, the Lord gave the Amorites over to Israel. Amorites are sort of like collective name for all those, those five kings. Verse 13, Joshua now prays to God uh, for a bit more time. He prays that the sun would stand still. And there's lots of different explanations for this. Um, we won't go into all of them, but some, somehow or other, there's an extended period of time. Um, in our little Bible study group, we said maybe it was a day and a half um, that, that Joshua and the Israelites had. Whatever it is, the writer in verse 14, this is what he concludes from it. He says, there's never been a day like it before or since. Well, there's never been such a long day. <laughs> it was an extended day. And he also adds, a day when the Lord listened to a human being. And I, I thought that was an interesting thing that he added there. Because there's a number of times that God actually does respond. We see with that with um, Abraham and also with uh, Moses. Joshua is asking something of God that only God can do to, to change the, the natural order of things, to extend the day, whether it's by stopping the sun or, or the moon coming out and shining brightly. Whichever way it is, he's extending the amount of time that they've got. God doesn't have to do that, but he does. He graciously answers. And I was challenged about that because sometimes I think, you know, with our prayers, we sort of can pray almost flippantly or, oh, well, I guess I better pray about it. Um, and sometimes, you know, we, we, we approach prayer with that kind of just not really thinking God's going to do something. Um, I, I've shared with a, a number of you how a couple of weeks ago, just before Val's uh, funeral, um, a couple of days before I had this really bad cough and my throat was burning and um, I really didn't think I'd be able to take Val's funeral. But a number of people were praying for me and um, I had this amazing experience where it was just sort of like 24 hours before, it was kind of like God just put a kind of a board there. It felt like a board because I didn't, my, my throat was just not sore anymore. And I didn't cough for the next 14 hours. I'd been coughing all the time. And, it was, and I, I practiced my, uh, what I was going to say at the funeral. And I really felt that God, said, God was saying, okay, you, you, you'll be able to do it. Now, the next morning, a few hours before the funeral, I was coughing again. But went to the funeral. And, and you know, uh, for you who were there, um, I didn't cough at all. As soon as I got into the car, I started coughing again. For the next five or six days, I was coughing so it didn't mean my cough was finished, but God was gracious answering prayers and allowing me to, to not cough during that funeral and to be there to, to take that. The next day for Joshua and the rest of the Israelites was a normal day. <laughs> but that particular day, God answered that prayer and did something mirac um, miraculous and marvellous. God granted the answer to his prayer and it encouraged them. I'm sure that they, I mean, there it is recorded. And the Israelites would remember that God had extended that day, had answered their prayers. And then there's that last bit in verse 14. Surely the Lord was fighting for Israel. Surely the Lord, just another little reminder, <laughs> it's God's battle. 
And then um, the writer goes on to talk about the mopping up operation, the five kings in the cave. Again, verse 19, the Lord your God has given them into your hand. They bring the kings out. The army commanders put their feet on the necks of the kings. Doesn't seem like a really nice thing to do. But I guess, I don't know, there was probably still some fear in the hearts of those commanders of, of the army. They weren't quite sure, is God really? I mean, God had already done so much on, on their campaign, but there were lots of other kings, as we'll find out in a minute. And, um, and maybe it was, was like an object lesson as to the fact that God will do this to all their enemies. This is what God will do. He'll, he'll be st stamping down their enemies. And again, these words come from God that resound through the whole of Joshua. Don't be afraid. Don't be discouraged. Be strong and courageous. So the kings are killed. They're hung up until the end of the day and, they, um, and then they're, they're, they're buried. There's a pile of rocks over them. Do you notice another pile of rocks? How many piles of rocks have we come across so far? They cross the Jordan, a pile of rocks. They, they uh, take Jericho, there's a pile of rocks. Achan, Sin, there's a pile of rocks. Ai, another pile of rocks. This is the fifth pile of rocks. Piles of rocks. Now, you sort of think, well, why is this being mentioned? Well, it's mentioned a couple of times that those piles of rocks are there to this day for, for the writer. So for years later, they see those piles of rocks. It's a reminder that God won the battle. God has brought them into this land. And the idea is that God says, I don't want you to forget. Those piles of rocks are there so you don't forget. Verse 28 to 43, which we didn't read, basically goes over the mopping up operation. Joshua and the army go around to the various, those five um, cities, five areas where the, where the kings were from, and they uh, seek to conquer them. They don't actually conquer all of them. Jerusalem is one that doesn't get conquered. It's not actually conquered till David's time, hundreds of years later. It's an interesting um, side, side note there. You can follow up yourselves. Joshua, uh, verse, uh, verse 42, Joshua conquers uh, those southern kings because the Lord fought for Israel. And it's the fact that Joshua, he did just what the Lord asked him to do. He obeyed the Lord. And so the reminder in the very last verse, verse 42, the Lord fought for Israel. The Lord fought for Israel. Now, this isn't just God winning a battle here in Canaan. It's actually God keeping his promises that he made to Abraham 600 years before, that the Israelites would be a great nation, that they would live in Canaan, that he would bless Abraham and he in turn would be a blessing to all other nations. So we go on to chapter 11 and chapter 11 um, uh, we come across the northern campaign. So they've, they've defeated the kings in the south and in the north in um, verse 1 to 5 there's, there's this, a description of a huge army again that's, that's um, gathered together by a guy called Jabin who's the king of Hazor. And he gathers these, all these different kings. It's, it's a huge, much, much bigger army than the southern coalition. In fact, the, the writer um, says they were as numerous as the sand on the seashore. And they've also got horses and chariots. So they've got numerical strength. They've got technological strength. that The Israelites don't have horses and chariots. And it makes you realize that only if God, only if God is with them that they're going to win this battle. There's no way the Israelites can win on their own strength. Now, I, I thought I'd show you, um, for you, for those of you who, like me, like maps, um, I don't know if you, you can't see that one too clearly. I'm going to blow it up in a minute. But uh, here's a map of the, um, of, the, of the campaign. So on the um, right-hand side of, of, the, of the map, you've got, you've got the Jordan River. So they've taken the places on the, jo on the uh, eastern side of the Jordan River and then they come across to, to Gilgal and to Jericho and Ai, which is sort of in the middle. So they've taken Jericho and Ai, and then they fight against those southern kings, and then they go up to the north, fight against the northern kings. Now the next map will show a bit more detail. Okay, there's the, the campaign against the southern kings. So you'll see where Jericho, Ai are, and Gibeon, 
And then there's um, Adonai uh, Zedek. He's, he's, uh, he's from Jerusalem. All those kings in the south. So they have, they have, they've had their fight and then they mop up. Go, they go from city to city. Then they go up north to the next slide. And, have, and there's the northern campaign. And there's um, uh, Hazor. And that, that guy Jabin is, the, is sort of the... Uh, he gets all those kings together. And they're defeated up there. You can see where the lake... Uh, the, the next little bit we're going to look at is this, um, this, this lake, the, the waters of Meron. Now, we don't know exactly where that is, but it's somewhere around where that lake Meron is. Okay, so we've got this, huge, this description of this huge army. And notice what God says to Joshua. In verse 6 and 7 of chapter 11, God says, Don't be afraid of them. If we can go on to the next slide. God says, Don't be a... Oh, no, sorry, I missed the Deuteronomy bit, didn't I? Yep. Because I, I was, it was interesting, because back in Deuteronomy, remember when Moses is still alive, they've, they've defeated the kings on the eastern side of the Jordan, and, and Moses is giving his sort of like final speech, and he says, when you go to, out to battle against your enemies and see, your, and see horses and chariots plus an army larger than yours, you must not be afraid of them, for Yahweh your God is with you, the one who brought you up from the land of Egypt. So he's saying this probably something like you know, five, four or five years beforehand. Um, not, not sure exactly the timing there, but some time beforehand. And this is to, to, to just prepare them. Yes, there will be big armies massed against you. They'll, they'll have horses and chariots, but God is with you. He's going to win the battle. The one who brought you up from the land of Egypt. Okay, back to the next one then. Chapter 11, verse 6 and 7. God again says to Joshua, don't be afraid of them because by this time tomorrow I will hand all of them slain over to Israel. Hmm, seems quite a cocky sort of statement, you know, overconfident and bold. But this is God, the ruler of the universe. And he's just again just saying, to, just reminding um, Joshua, it's okay, I've got this. You're going to win. I'm going to hand them over to you. It's God's battle. He's already won it. But then notice in verse 7, so Joshua and his whole army came against them, that's the um, coalition forces, came against them suddenly at the waters of Merom and attacked them. And the Lord gave them into the hand of Israel. So Joshua and the Israelites surprised this, this army. And it says that Joshua's army came on them suddenly. And uh, so, so what happens here? As I said before, we don't know exactly where this... Um, this place, this waters of Meron is, but the two likely possibilities are both um, up ab about 4,000 feet above sea level. And they weren't places that were conducive to manoeuvre chariots around. So probably what Joshua has done is he's made a surprise attack on them. While they're still massing this army, he's come and um, attacked them, um, surprised them before they've got themselves together because they were probably planning to go down to one of the plains and there to meet Joshua where their chariots would, would, have, uh, um, would, would be able to do more damage. But here's Joshua attacking them before they're organised and so throws them into confusion. God's with them. He gives, he gives the victory to them. Um, and, and, and in any case, Joshua's blitz kind of negates the tactical advantage that these chariots and horses could give. It's an interesting little note from the author. From the author. He didn't have to include that, but he does. And I think it's a reminder to me that just because Yahweh promises victory in verse 6, it's no reason not to use your brains in verse 7. Joshua has gone in there obediently but he's also surprised the enemy. His tactics and God's sovereignty bring about victory. And I love the way that this emphasises God's sovereignty, but also the need for us to trustingly be active. Sometimes we hear that phrase, let go and let God. And I, I understand where that's coming from. And it has the idea that, in other words, just let, let God do it all. Just sit back and let God. And there is a, an element of truth in that, but... Joshua's view was not to let go, but to grab hold of that promise that God had given them. He and the Israelites moved confidently, made plans, trusting in God's power. 
And I was encouraged by the thought that this actually liberates us when we take hold of God's promises. It liberates us to trust God in what we do. We trust God while at the same time doing what Glenn was encouraging us to do last week from chapter 9, inquiring of the Lord. Not to forget, to inquire, Lord, is this the right way forward? Is this the right way to go? Should we do things this way? But to go, be active, trust in God. Okay, chapter 12. Um, again, this is uh, the campaign against the, um, um, the, the northern kings. And basically it's, it's a whole list of um, um, the different kings that, that, that are taken. Now at the end of, end of the chapter, there's a list of 31 kings. So there's the king of Jericho, one. The king of Ai, one. The king of Jerusalem, one. The king of Hebron, one. The king of Jamoth, one. The king of Lachish, one. The king of Eglon, one. The king of Giza, one. The king of Debir, one. The king of Geder, one. The king of Homa, one. The king of Arad, one. And there are 17 more. 31 kings all together at the end. And you sort of think, what's that in the Bible for? Why does he go through every one of them? What's, it doesn't sound very interesting to us. But the, and, and the writer begins this chapter. We actually left out a whole lot of things because there's at the beginning of the chapter, Sihon and Og, the kings on the eastern side that were defeated under Moses, they're also listed there. And then there's, there's all these 31 kings who are defeated on the western side of the Jordan River. Now, a couple of things here. Why is this in the Bible? <laughs> what, what, what's, what's it doing there? Well, first thing, um, the writer, I think, is very conscious that there's that Jordan River can separate the, 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 the Israelite people. There's two and a half tribes on the eastern side. There's nine and a half tribes on the western side. It would be very easy for their unity to be destroyed because there's a sort of a, a, a barrier there. And so the writer's wanting to guard the unity of the people. And the, the, the tribes on the eastern side, there might come a day when maybe the guys on the western side say, oh, those ones there, are they really part of our people? And he wants to protect that. And so here's the reminder in this chapter that God gave victories on the eastern side and the western side on both sides of the Jordan River. He was in charge of the battles on both sides. There were no borders. They were all God's people. And it's a reminder to us that all of us from our different backgrounds, our different interests are all God's people. You know, people get together in clubs and organisations uh, because of a common interest. You know, you have a football club, you support a particular team, or you have a chess club, you have a, a Dungeons and Dragons club even, uh, a bowling club, all kinds of different organisations where people with a common interest meet together. In the church, our only common interest is that we follow Jesus. But what a common interest. In other words, you know, we, we, in, in other ways, we may not have many other connections but our following Jesus affects everything about our lives and in a very real way I'm a brother with everyone here who follows and loves Jesus it's not just being a member of a club it's actually being a member of a family a member of God's family in fact our lives are so intertwined that the Bible tells us that God has actually given us gifts um, to each of us so that we can build up and encourage each other. The other thing that this long list reminds us is of God's faithfulness. God promised that he would bring Abraham's descendants into this land and he's doing it. And here's the list of every king that's been defeated. It's a bit like, I guess, um, you know, the Penrith guys, you know, they might sort of say, okay, here's our, here's our list of all the people we defeated this year. And, well, they did lose a few games to the storm. But anyway, um, but, they, but they won the finals and they won the grand final. Here's the list of every king that's been defeated. So if you're an Israelite and your child says to you, how do I know that God defeated the Canaanites? Okay, look here, Sonny Jim. Here it is written down. There was the king of Jericho. There was the king of Ai. There's the king of Hebron. There's the king of... And so we went on. 
through 31 kings, every one of them has been defeated. Isn't God amazing? You can tell that young Sonny Jim. He keeps his promises. And so there's that record that was so important for God's people, but also for us today, as we remember that God is a God who keeps his promises. As we finish up this morning and as we continue through Joshua, it's clear that this battle of taking the land of Canaan is God's battle. He is the winner. And today we remember the battle that took place when Jesus was here, the battle that he won on the cross. He has defeated Satan and death through his resurrection. That was the final battle, the final act of God. Today we are involved in God's battle in the world. But we don't use swords or chariots or horses. We live and speak the truth in love. Only in Jesus, only in God, will we experience true rest. Let us trust the one who has already won the battle. As the writer to the Hebrews says, don't, go, don't grow weary in following and trusting God. Don't follow other things which seem more attractive in our world, but which will not satisfy us. Because we're made to live with God, and we're made to live in his ways. Keep persevering. Keep praying for God to give us a desire for him above every other desire. God has won the battle. He's defeated Satan. Let's live in the truth of that. Let's pray. Thank you, Lord, for the reminders here that you fought for the Israelites, that you gave them the victory. Help us to trust you in all that we're encountering in our lives, to ask you how we are to live. Give us a desire for you above all other desires. Help us to live and speak the truth in love today and through this week. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.